And still, I said, where is he? I thought in my mind, I just needed to get to him. You know, in that moment, I felt like he needed me. I needed to get to where he was. I assumed he was in hospital. And he said, I don't have all the details yet, but it doesn't look like he's made it. He's, he said he's gone. Again, now bullets in here. Renowned rapper Kieran Forbes, popularly known as AKA, has been shot and killed in Durban. KZN police say the multi-award winner and his close associate were leaving a restaurant on Florida Road when the suspects opened fire on them. Police in KZN are investigating two counts of murder. This follows the murder of award-winning musician Kieran Forbes, also known as AKA. So many burning questions. So little time. I'm Carol Afori, and this is the Carol Afori Podcast, where we answer all the questions that keep going around in circles in your head. This time, I sit down with Lynn Forbes for a heart-to-heart conversation about how she's doing following the brutal murder of her son, international hip-hop star, a.k.a. Internationally renowned South African rapper Keenan Forbes, proudly known as AKA, was shot and killed in Florida Road right here in Durban, South Africa, on the night of Friday, the 10th of February, 2023. Now, the multi-award winning hip hop star was just 35 years old when the nation heard of his passing. Now, Super Mega has won many accolades throughout his career, including Best Male Artist Award at the South African Music Awards and an MTV Africa Music Award and numerous nominations at the BET Awards. Keenan was killed alongside his close friend, 41-year-old celebrity chef and entrepreneur Deba Lotibs Motswani. The men were gunned down as they were leaving a restaurant called Wish out in Florida Road in Durban. Now, a CCTV video of the incident went viral on social media, leaving many hearts broken and many questions unanswered. To date... No arrests have been made and the inv- investigation is still ongoing. Now, sitting with me today is AKA's mother. I first met her under the name Glammy and everybody knows her as Lynn Forbes. Thank you so much, Lynn, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I remember the last time we chatted, Lynn, I was still at Radio 2000 and you were one of my first yeah. guests and we chatted yeah. so beautifully about Glammy and how your social media had exploded and you had the super famous son. But you also have, you know, your own career as a motivational speaker and so many other things that you do in your life. I'm thinking, wasn't it after we came, I came back from Mount Kilimanjaro? You had just done Mount Kilimanjaro. There were so many things going on in your life. It was an exciting time. Yes. <laughs> it, it, it was an exciting time. And here we are. 2023 and of course it's been a tragic start to the year for you and your family how are you doing how are you doing overall how are you doing with everything that's happened how are you doing yeah tomorrow will be 12 weeks in i'm gonna have to start counting in months and not weeks anymore so i am to be honest with you i'm in a good space but I have very bad moments. That's the best way I can describe it. Uh, as a family, we are getting through the days. I do realize that my life has forever changed and that I would forever be a different person. I would never be the glammy or the Lynn that everybody knows. I mean, I'll be essentially the same person, but a part of me has been removed forever. So I think I will be forever changed. Mm. Yeah, and it is it is a very tragic situation that um, your family is going through. I cannot even imagine on that morning of the 10th of February what you and your family are going through. Do you remember that morning, waking up, what the mood was, what it was like for you, and then, of course, how the night went? You're talking about the Friday morning because he was he, he died in the evening of yeah. that Friday, the 10th. Are you talking about the Friday morning yeah. before? Yeah. Yeah. It was it was a beautiful day. It was um, Caro and myself had just finished spending a week at Kenan's because he, she was leaving back to stay with her mom. You know, so she would stay for with her dad for a week, and then she would leave and stay with her mom for a week. So we were finishing off the week with him. And he woke up in the morning. He asked me to wake him up that morning so that he could say goodbye to her because she was going to school. I was taking her to school. And he, he he just spent the morning having breakfast with her. He chatted to her. They were laughing. We were all just having a great time. And he told her that uh, daddy's going to miss you. I can't wait for you to be back um, next week. And you must always remember that daddy loves you. And that's how he said goodbye. When I came back from school, uh, my sister and I, my sister was here and we were going away for the weekend. 
and we were teasing. You, you, you used to love teasing me, and you would say, "Oh, mom, you're going on this road trip, and you seem so excited." You know, I hope you've checked the car. And he was always very protective of me. Wanted to make sure the car was fine. And he, he yeah, he, we we said goodbye. Nadia was there. She said goodbye to him because she was leaving. And he, um, he asked me if I would be back because I was going out shopping before we left, and he wanted to know if I would be back before he left for Durban. And I said, I don't think so. And he said, well, I won't see you again then. And he gave me a big hug and, you know, he blew us some kisses as we drove off. That's how we said goodbye. And were those the last words that you you shared with your son or did you speak to him later on in the day on the phone? We didn't speak. He was obviously off to Durban. No, those were the last. The last words to me was, I love you, Um, be safe, gave me a big hug and he blew some kisses as the car drove off. And I've always heard from yeah. people who've lost loved ones in, in tragic situations that there's always like some sort of feeling, something just doesn't feel right on that day or something's out of the yeah. ordinary. Um, did you have any feeling like that on that Friday the 10th? I didn't. I, you know, we were all in such a great space. We were, Kenan has been so different. Kenan loved having us around his house. He never wanted us to leave. He I felt like we were starting off the year on a very good note. Um, He also, he spoke a lot about mom this year. I just want to spend so much more time with you. He, I I don't know. I just thought we were in the best space. So I did not feel any, I didn't feel anything that was out of the ordinary, except for the blowing kisses. He never, he used to hug and do that, but he never blew kisses. I think that was the only thing that was different on that day. Yeah. The blowing of the kisses. Now, Friday yeah. night comes along and you get that call. Do you remember where you were at the moment and who the voice was telling you this tragic news? I do. I was, as I said, my sister and myself and her husband and some other family members, we were going away for the weekend on, on a golfing weekend. I wasn't playing golf, but we were going along with the girls, with the men. And um, we were actually in Pretoria at my cousin's house. We went out for dinner that evening and came back. We were planning on leaving the next morning early on the Saturday morning. So we just arrived back from dinner probably at around 10, just after 10, maybe 11.30 around there. Um, and my phone battery had died at the restaurant. So I had it on on charge, which was probably the best thing because I – it saved me from seeing this on social media and my younger son Stefan phoned my brother-in-law we were just sitting in the lounge chatting having a glass of wine and the phone rang Trevor's phone my brother-in-law's Trevor and he I could hear him saying hi Steph which is Stefan and he left the room and we didn't really take much notice of it and he stayed away for a while we were just chatting and laughing and then he came back in to the lounge and he sat down beside me on the couch behind me, which was strange because he, we very, you know, we are very loving family, but he's not that physical with me. So I thought, I thought it was nice. And, um, but then I saw my sister because he put his arms around me and my sister's face and my cousin's face. I knew something was wrong because my sister looked at him and she got up from her chair and she said, Trevor, what's wrong? And I turned around to look at him. And his face was just, I just told a story of something bad has happened. And I immediately thought it was, it was maybe my mom. Um, I said, what happened? What is it, mom? What happened? And he, he could already speak. His lip quivered. I can remember his lip quivering. And he said, um, no, he said, it's Kenan. He said, it's Kenan. And I can't remember exactly. I said, um, I think I said, what, what happened? What happened? Is he okay? Maybe something to that effect. And he said, no, Lenny got shot. And still I said, where is he? I thought in my mind, I just needed to get to him. You know, in that moment, I felt like he needed me. I needed to get to where he was. I assumed he was in hospital. And he said, I don't have all the details yet, but it doesn't look like he's made it. He said he's gone. And I, um, I don't know. I I think I screamed. Um, I was sitting on the couch and I can only remember myself finding myself on the, on the floor. And I think my, I can, I can just remember everything else literally just kind of became, 
that fuzzy in my head. I think, um, you know, your body kind of protects you from what you're hearing in some way. And I, I can just remember my myself. I, I was on my knees on the floor, and I think my sister tried to just hold me and console me. And I, I think I couldn't even, I didn't even want that. I it is just the most devastating thing that you can ever hear as a mother. I don't think that, um, you know, I've lost many people. I lost my dad in the last two years during COVID. I lost my dad. I lost two sisters. I lost my grandmother. I lost four uncles. And I could never have been prepared for, for that pain. And I don't think I realized it really until the next day. Uh, I, I don't think it sunk in until the next day that he was actually gone. So at the time, we didn't really have the details of it. We, um, you know, the, the information was still coming through. We, we, I just kept on saying, please phone them again, phone them. Uh, just ask what happened. And I'm sure it's a mistake, you know. And then Stefan, my son, came through with friends of his and probably about a, an hour later they came to fetch me. And I can remember Stefan just holding me and he's just said, Mom, Mom, I will make sure everything will be fine. And, yeah, I just know that I've never felt pain like that even in my life before. Yeah. I still feel that, you know. Yeah. I wake up every morning and every morning is just a confirmation. So I find the morning still now, all this time. I know people go on with life, but I do go on with life, but it's just never the same. I wake up every morning and it's just a confirmation that I will never hear his voice again. People, you know, I, I thought in the beginning that I can hear his voice. I can turn on the TV. I can listen to his music. There's mass country. I listen to it every day. I hear his voice, but, the most painful thing is that I actually will never, Kenan, Kenan would phone me almost every day and check on me and send me messages, but I will never have that again. The phone never, the phone has just gone quiet. He just doesn't phone anymore, you know, and I really struggle with that. Yeah. Yeah. How is Stefan doing? I mean, he obviously the one who called his uncle to break the news, obviously, after maybe trying to call you. How is he doing? Because I, I do know on his socials, for example, in Instagram, the last picture he posted on his Instagram is of his big brother yeah. on his birthday. Yeah. How is he doing? You know, apart from Stefan, I think everybody, Stefan, including the rest of the family, it's just, it's just something that we have to get used to. I think we're all just struggling. Um, you don't know really how to how to process it. Um, so I think what applies to me applies to everybody else, including Stefan. It's just that we we are not on the couch under a blanket with our heads covered. Um, we continue with life because we don't really have a choice. You have to. But I think for him, the same applies. And I obviously can't speak on his behalf because I can't get inside his head. But what I do know is that we all are really battling with coming to terms with the fact that Kenan is gone forever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you didn't mention that um, you were happy that your phone was charging at the time because you didn't want to hear this news from social media. And of course, yeah. many of us have, have lost loved ones, but it's a different story when you see your loved one's last breaths on a social media platform that's gone viral. How do you feel yeah. about this video? Have you have you seen it? Um, how do you feel about it? How does your family feel about it? I mean, it's completely yeah. shocking. I mean, many people, like I said, have lost loved ones, but we don't see our loved ones' final mm -hmm. moments. That is traumatizing, to say the least. Absolutely. It's, it's really traumatizing. And this, um, yes, I'll answer that question. I think there's also so many different layers to this, you know, I compare this to, and it doesn't make it less painful that you, when you le lose a loved one, but with, for us in the situation, you don't, for me, firstly, I, I lose my son. And if that was all, then, then, you know, maybe it's easier to deal with it. But 
now there is this public figure and it's all over social media and it's so public and the way in which he dies. So it just, I call it levels of grief that you have to deal with. There's so many different aspects to it. But the video itself, I think it is probably the most inhumane thing anybody can do. Uh, I think people don't understand that sharing or leaking a video like that, the devastation it causes for the family. Um, and it's so insensitive. And I think, you know, it might be entertainment people. I don't even know if that's the right word or maybe it's not entertainment or people are just, you know, we just want to see. Everybody wants to watch this video because that's why it goes viral because everybody watches it. I decided not to watch the video. I didn't want to see it. But again, because I am very active on social media, at some point I did have to get back to social media because this, that's where I do a lot of what I do. And I wasn't spared the pain of stumbling across the shortened version of the video where it's literally a few seconds with just the actual shooting. So I see the person walk up to, well, not even, he's already there. I see the shooting and I see him just kind of, fall down to the ground and then I see them running and um, that image is just you know that's one of the things that I see when I close my eyes because I need to replace that that memory with something more positive and something more uplifting I guess because um, I think that's probably one thing I didn't ever want to see of Kenan or any anybody else or anybody else that I loved is, you know, it's just so different from what and who he is. He's such a, you know, he's such a larger than life personality. He's such a beautiful soul. He's such a person that fills the room with light and makes us all laugh. And to see him reduced to that is very painful for me. And I think even more painful is the fact that I I don't think I've been trying to find out if there's any way I could have that video removed because I don't ever want Cairo to see it. But it seems like I can't and it's been shared so many times that it's probably going to live there forever and one day I guess she will also see it, you know, and that breaks my heart that I can't, sh I can't spare her that pain of seeing that those visuals one day and for me I know that I have to find a I have to somehow replace that in my mind with something else because that is a haunting thing for me it, it, it really does haunt me to see him you know just standing there chatting being so happy him and Tib seeing each other on that day, um, just being in such a good space, hugging, and then the next thing, somebody just in a second just destroys everything and takes him, I mean, takes his life away, but takes not him from me, takes him from Cairo, takes him from everybody that loves him, takes him from his fans, takes just takes him away like just with one bullet, you know, and I, I just realized that, you know, how life can change so drastically in, in, in a second. That's one pull of a trigger. It's just you, it's just, I can't fathom it. It's just, you know, that he could just be there one moment and then he's just gone the next moment. And that's what I have to deal with um, as a mom. And I think, you know, also what I I think about often is I just wonder what, I know that he probably maybe i don't even know maybe a split second of the awareness that something was somebody was there or maybe the people in front of him maybe their facial expressions because they must have seen it coming in a few seconds sooner than he might have realized there was something happening and i just wonder if there was anything going through his mind or what was you know in that moment was there time to even think about oh my gosh i'm leaving my family or I don't know. I I just feel like what I wanted more than anything, I wanted to just be there for him. You know, you know, you as a mom, you're there when your children are born, and you're there in every other moment of their lives. And I just I was there when he took his first breath. I wanted to be there when he took his last breath, and I was denied that. 
And that pains me a lot. Yeah. It is a completely tragic um, situation that you and your family are in. South Africa is in. Fans are in. Um, I think everybody on the 11th of February woke up to to shock. I mean, I remember how I got the news. My my husband sent me a message. And um, yeah. I read the message. It was the first thing I saw on my phone. And I, I could not believe it. It just yeah. it didn't seem real at all. At this stage, yes. have you got any updates on investigations? I think a lot of people are asking for so many questions to be answered. Um, last I heard, there weren't any arrests. Have, have you heard anything? Is there any developments that you've heard? The news is the same for us as, as was out there in public. The police are um, the investigating team. They are keeping us updated, but there's nothing different. There's nothing new. Uh, and I think even if there was, you know, it's an ongoing investigation. It is a high profile case. It's it's a terrible tragedy and, and it's a terrible crime. And I don't believe that they would give us anything that, um, can jeopardize the investigation. So it's probably better for us to know less. So if they have, they, it's the same. I mean, we had a, a recent update and we met with them and they told us that they're making progress. And that is, you know, it's public knowledge. It's not, there's nothing that we know that is only for the family and that we, you know, that we know differently from what's out there. Uh, there are no arrests, um, as far as we know, and I'm sure we would have known if there was, and I'm sure even the media will probably know before us, but uh, they do keep us updated. Uh, but there's nothing, absolutely nothing that I can tell you that is different from what is out there already. Do you believe- but I do just say, I do just want to say that, you know, it's not like they're not keeping, they are telling us, they, they are telling us, um, you know, for instance, they actually meet. Uh, we actually met with them, so it's not like they're not updating us. It's just that the information that is coming through is just not different from what is already out there. Right. Do you believe that there will be arrests in this case? Do you believe we will find out who did this? Carol, to be honest with you, I want to trust that there will be. I um, personally, you know, it's it's not, let me rather tell you this. For me, it's not something that is keeping me awake at night. Um, for me, yes, I think in, in, in terms of justice and, you know, for, for, for everybody, for us as a country, there should be justice, not just for Kenan, but for anybody else that dies and their families and, you know, sit there with questions. I I don't have questions, to be honest with you. And I'm being very honest with you. I, people ask me about closure, for instance, and justice. And personally, as a mother, the closure I have, I don't need to know who shot him to have the closure. I don't need to know. That is not information that's going to change my situation. I'm still going to, wake up and you won't be there and I'm still going to go to bed and you won't be there. But so for me, that's not at the, at the forefront of what I'm looking for. For me, it's more important to remember Kenan. And so it's not a yes or no answer for me. I don't want to say no. I don't think there will ever be arrests. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, I just don't know if there will ever be arrests. And I don't want to take that line of saying, I don't believe there will never be a race. I don't believe any of this stuff. I don't believe. I want to believe that the law will run its course and, and the investigation will be handled in the best way possible. I just have to believe that to, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be negative and, and, and not believe that will happen. It's just not the most important thing for me. Because mm-hmm. nothing will bring him back. I yeah. I believe that obviously also, you know, that this was, this is an organized crime. This is a hit. I believe that. And obviously it's not just me believing that that is what has been said. 
we all saw the video and you know there was nothing that was somebody walking up to him putting a gun to his head and 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 killing him so i do believe somebody is behind this so again for me also you know carol if there are two things here there's somebody who pulled a trigger and i don't know if help it will help anybody or help me if I knew who that person was. I don't think that person had any issues with Kenan. I don't believe the person who killed, who pulled the trigger, hated my son. I don't know even if that person knew my son. I don't think he had any. He was just doing a job that he was paid for. And um, the person who paid for the bullet. So, So to answer your question, I think there might be an arrest for the person who pulled the trigger. Whether we would find the person who paid for the bullet, that one I'm not sure about. I, I don't really believe that will ever happen. And so for me, finding the person who, who pulled the trigger, there's absolutely, there's nothing in that that, that speaks of justice to me. Yeah. I, I'm. I'm really. I don't have issues with that person. I. I don't feel any hate for them. I don't feel any negative feelings towards them. I think they are just another person that's been used by somebody else, and I actually really don't have any anger towards them. I don't. I've forgiven them. Wow. I'm. I'm fascinated by your response that you say you've forgiven the person who who pulled the trigger. Um. I guess my, my follow-up question would be, you know, I, I, I obviously, I have a son. He's seven yeah. years old. You know, he's very young. Um, and I cannot even imagine what you're going through as a mom to a son that you've raised 35 whole years of colorful memories and, and, and experiences and just moments that have come together in those 35 years. For me, it's, it, it, it's powerful to, to, to see you you know, saying this because a lot of people would, would have resentment and want the answers and, and say, I want to know, uh, and this person must pay, you know? Yeah, I, I think if, I, if that is what I focus on and I, what I put my energy into, it will hurt me more than it will hurt them. It will eat me up inside. And I want to remember Kenan, you know, and, I, and this is maybe a message that I hope... I could share with other moms who ever lose their children. And I hope touch wood that that never happens to anybody. I, I think it's the worst thing. But all I'm left with is the, are the memories. And they are beautiful memories. I'm left with the memories. Um, and I hang on to them. And I'm left with so many people around me. I'm left with my, I've got, I have another son. I have a loving family. I have an extended, beautiful, blended family. I have Cairo. There's so much to focus on, you know, yeah. that I think Kenan would need to focus on. I believe he would want me to focus on that. I believe he would want me to be peaceful. I don't think Kenan would want me to be revengeful. I think he, I don't think he would want that for me uh, because I'm, I think and I believe he would want me to make peace and remember him and not waste my energy on anything that would not benefit me in the end or our family in the end. And I I believe he would want me to focus my energy on loving the people that are still here and yeah. building a legacy for him and, and well, not building, he's got his own legacy, but carrying that legacy forward. I believe that's what he wanted me to put my energy into because um, I think he would feel that whoever did this, you know, if I put my energy into trying and my anger, and I'm not saying I don't ever get angry. There are times when I'm angry, but I'm not going to waste my energy on focusing on those people because that would actually just that would make them win. I don't believe they've won by killing him. Kenan cannot, Kenan, Kenan can never disappear from this earth. Right. It doesn't matter what people say or have said or have done or will say in the future or any kind of 
tarnishing his character or or his you know assassinating because there's two things there's the assassination of his character there's the assass- assassination of his actual physical being and i am the pace we i'm so peaceful that he's at peace now is that he's resting and I know he's with God. I know he's in heaven because that's how he spent his last days on this earth. And I believe that, um, you know, Kiernan is, a.k.a. Kiernan is going to live forever. Yeah. In our heart, in our, you know, in he's all around us. Mm. And nobody can take that away. It doesn't matter what you try and do. It doesn't matter how you want to portray him in this, you know, in in the media, the people, let me tell you something, the people who have ever met Kenan and who have spent time with him, they know who he, he was and who he is and who will, he'll be forever that person. And nothing that anybody can say or do will ever change that in our hearts. And if you sit down with a room full of people that have really known Kenan, it's the most beautiful thing to sit and listen to. The way he was so generous and the way he helped everybody. Now, let's not forget, I'm not trying to make my, I mean, he is an angel in heaven now, but I, I'm also very, <laughs> Kenan was, wasn't, he wasn't an angel on earth. You, you know, Kenan was difficult and Kenan was uh, outspoken and Kenan, you know, kind of rubbed people up the wrong way a lot of times, but I wouldn't want him any other way. That was him. But, there are just things about him, you know, that's kind of makes it to the media. And I had to grow rhino skin about that. Yeah. And a really thick skinned about it because I know who my son was. Yeah. I know he, I know him and I know what he's capable of and I know what he's not capable of. And his mouth can be bigger than he was. He, he had a tiny, tiny heart, you know. <laughs> And now, I mean, yeah. we're, we're East Coast Radio, so we're out in Durban and this tragic, tragic um, murder happened in our city. And it's, it's broken many of our hearts, many, many of our hearts. Have you ever been yes. back to Durban and how do you feel about Durban? Are you scared to come to Florida Road? Are you done with us? How do you feel about, you know, Durban? I'm not scared. Let me start with being, talking about being scared. I, I'm not scared. I... I've decided a long time ago, a lot has happened in my life and you and I have spoken about all the things that I've gone through in my own life. And I've learned that fear is something that I can't live with because fear is the most devastating thing. Fear is something that just keeps you kind of in jail, in your own personal prison. It it feels like you are just constantly being suffocated if you live in fear all the time. So no, I'm not I'm not scared. I believe that uh, our lives, you know, what I'm trying to say is is I don't believe that I would never go to Durban again. I think it's just natural at the moment that we as a family, maybe, again, I don't like to speak for other people, but for myself, I have no desire to go to Durban at the moment. Um, What I do have a desire for and it's not about Durban. I mean, this is not a, about Durban. It's just, I think, getting on a plane, going to Durban, it just will bring up so many. It will open up so much. It will be so emotionally charging and triggering for me to do that. So it's not Durban as a place. It's not Durban as people. I think Kiernan loved Durban. He absolutely loved Durban. He, he's, his fan base is there. The legacy is, is, is alive and well in Durban, you know, and Kenan loved that place and he really loved his fans and he he would, I don't think he would ever want us not to go to Durban and I think that's why he actually went to Durban. He was never uh, going to be the person that's, that wouldn't do that. And I would come to Durban at some point. What I really want to do one day, I think one of the yearnings I have is to stand in the spot where he died and just be there. I know that his soul is not there anymore and his body is not there anymore, but that is the last place where he was alive. And I think it would be important for me at some point to just stand in that spot. So that is something I definitely want to do. But And I can't say, you know, 
I can't say that I would never come to Durban. I don't think, I don't know when it will be, um, but it's got nothing to do with the place, you know. Durban has many people, you know, uh, I don't know how many people were involved in this, but the whole of Durban wasn't against Kian and the whole of Durban didn't hate him enough to kill him. I think if we look at percentage-wise, I would think 99.999% of Durban probably loves Kenan and will always love him. And I get messages from people in Durban, in South Africa, in the world all the time, but from Durban and people will tell me how much he meant to them and how much they love me and how much they feel for me and how much they're mourning with me. So no, I don't have an issue with Durban as a place. I don't have an issue with Durban as people. And I will come to Durban at some point. I just don't think I'm ready now because that's where he died. That's I would have to relive that flight that he went on. I would relive that moment when he said to me, Mom, I'm going to the airport at three. He went off there. I would get off there and I would know this is the last airport he put his foot down. This is the last time he left this airport. So it will be it's too early for me to yeah. do that. But I have no issues with Durban or their people. In fact, if it's the legacy, I love them because Ken and love them. Wow. You know, the Durban question is obviously a very big question for us in Durban. Um, I can tell yeah. you that our hearts were very, very sore. As a city, a lot of people were just saying, like, why, why here? Like, why did this have to happen here? Why did it have to happen, you know, on a road that is so popular in our city? Uh, you know, Durban's been through so much. We had the floods times two where we lost lots of people. The unrest was just terrible. And then now to lose um, AKA and Tibbs on a very important strip for tourism for the province and for job creation, for nightlife, for, you know, a vibe uh, on Florida Road was just so tragic. And that's why that question for me, I think, is one for Debonites. Your response is going to sit deep in our hearts because we we know not only yourself, there are many people who are like, I'm like, I don't know about Durban. I'm so scared. I think we need to always remember that things can happen anywhere. I live in Johannesburg and I can, you know, often I have visitors coming from maybe different cities or from overseas and or I go overseas and people talk about Johannesburg and how terrible a place it is. And I love the city. I love Johannesburg. I think, you know, we can't be ruled by fear. And unfortunately, things will happen Things will happen in Johannesburg and in Cape Town and in Durban. And we can't therefore now get ourselves into a situation where now we can't move around or now we cannot live anymore. And if it's our time, it's going to be our time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Now, I mean, every time I hear an AKA song on the radio, my heart just gets sore. But I also, you know, celebrate the music. Because if there's one thing your son heard was hits. And it was hits after hits. I mean, you can put his music on Spotify, iTunes, and just say, Alexa, play AKA. And yes. it will just keep playing and playing, and you'll be singing along and singing along. Um, how do you feel when you hear an AKA song? How does that make you feel? Proud, very proud. Uh, I, I just listen to his entire catalog at the moment. I mean, obviously, I listen to Mass Country all the time um it makes me incredibly proud and obviously also sad at times um you know because you realize that that's gonna be it maybe for aka and so yes it's 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 a mixed feeling a mixed bag of feelings it's a bit of sadness but mostly proud because i try and and focus on what he has achieved um and he did a lot and the current album i'm so proud of him for finishing that album he and you know previous albums he would work at the last minute it's like oh my gosh we've got this album has to be released at midnight and we're still sitting doing a little bit of this and that at 10 o'clock at night or something like that but kenan finished this album weeks in advance you know and um i'm just so proud that he actually did it so 
generally AK music at the moment, is, is there's a lot of it being played in my car, at my house, in the mornings, at night, anytime during the day, on my phone. And I'm just proud. I'm, I'm just so proud of him. That's the overwhelming feeling. Yeah. I'm just so proud as I'm. Yeah. Do you have a favorite song that um, he has that you like? I, I really like this one. On ma Mass Country or just generally? Overall, your favorite, Lynn, like when you hear that oh. song, you're like, that's my boy. But there's so many. People ask me this question often and it's really hard to, to actually choose because every song or many of them, it's so personal, you know. So I, I guess at the moment, for me at the moment, I really love some dope. Because, I love it too. Um, I love the story that some yeah. dope told at the memorial. I mean, yeah. it was insane. I didn't know there was a real person called some dope. And when he told the story and just yes. the friendship. And, absolutely. So some dope for me at the moment is the one that I listen to a lot because also some Piwe is, um, you know, he's just, it's a real person and he, he's just been an incredible friend to Ken and, and also at the moment, you know, he's just there. He's just, uh, I laugh because I say, you know, because there's a line that says, if I die, bring me back a sim dope. I pray, bring me back a sim dope. And he literally, I think, I feel like I said to some sim dope, to some, of course, now we all call him sim dope. I said, sim, Kenan really died and he, and he was brought back as you because now he's just stepping into, into those footsteps. You know, he's there for me. He's there for Cairo. He's there for the family. And I really think like God brought him back as some dope. <laughs> so I, I really, that. I love that song at the moment because it just, you know, some is just showing up, you know? Yeah. Are there any other people that surprise you that are showing up right now for you? I wouldn't say surprise. I think we were just always surrounded with incredible people. I mean, Zintle, Nadia, the friends, the team, family, my family, my closest family, extended family, they are, I've got some really, really close friends that's never been in the industry and that I kind of keep as my special, um, you know, group of people that I don't share with the world. And they've always been there and they've always will be there. And that's why I know they're real true friends. So I'm blessed, very blessed. We are blessed as a yeah. family. We've got so much going for us and so many people around us and we really feel loved, taken care of. And the world... I think what always really showed up is the Megacy. You know, I'm always yeah. going to talk about the Megacy. The Megacy has showed up like more than I could ever have imagined. They just, you know, those people are undying friends, like literally, excuse the pun. <laughs> <laughs> they are just in their millions. You yeah. know, I, I just feel like I've, I've lost my son and I've gained all these sons and daughters. You have to see the messages they send me. It's just... Um, I mean, I, I joined a, a Twitter space the other night. I've never, it's, it was the same thing like I did now with you because technologically I'm just, unless I have Stephen here to help me. So I joined a, a Twitter space with the Megacy the other night and it was the most beautiful thing. You know, wow. I feel like I've got a world full of children. Yeah, a world of children. I like that. I like that yeah. a lot. Um, now, of course, one talking point for many has been his grave. A lot of fans yeah. have gone to visit the grave. We spoke about it on my show and we had one yeah. one of our um, listeners actually say, I went to the grave actually just to pay respects to him. And he did mention mm -hmm. that I was very disappointed to see that there were like bottles. People were coming and having alcohol or whatever at the grave. And that did, was disappointing to see. How do you feel about yeah. so many people just accessing the grave, taking photos and some not, you know, being mindful of what they're doing there and leaving things behind? I don't have a problem with it. I feel, I've had many people send me messages saying, you know, people dress up and they go just take pictures, then they post it all over social media and it's so disrespectful. You see, for me, if we wanted to, I don't think Kenan would have wanted to be buried somewhere sacred away from where his, where his people couldn't access him. Kenan was a public figure. Kenan didn't belong just to us as a family. He belonged to South Africa and he carried the South African flag with so much pride around his shoulders all the time. And uh, he, I'm sure that Kenan's wish would have been, and let me tell you, firstly, Kenan didn't want to be cremated. It stated very clearly that he 
wanted a burial. And I don't think he would have wanted us to put him somewhere where only the family could access his grave. And and the way I deal with that is that Kenan, I look at Kenan's grave as a place where people can connect with him in some way or the other, um, because that's the only place where they can actually now go and have their conversations with him or have whatever it is that they need to do with him. And I've even thought about if anybody had to go there and maybe, um, you know, damage his grave stone or anything like that, I'll just put up another one. Because for me, I have no emotional connection as such to the grave. I don't believe, I mean, Ken, the grave, the outside of it is not Kenan. Kenan's body is buried there and his soul isn't there. I want people to be able to go there and feel that, you know, this is the least, this is a little bit of what we can do because we couldn't get everybody to the memorial, for instance. People need to say their goodbyes and they need to visit him. So if maybe people are going there and having a drink with him, so it's okay. Like them, bring him a bottle and say, you know, come on, let's have a, come on, super mega, let's have a drink. You know, leave a shot on you or whatever. I have never arrived at the grave and it was disgraceful. I've never arrived there and there was litter all over the place. I've arrived there and there were flowers and I've arrived there and there might be um, a little cup with something in it that maybe they left him a shot there. Or I've arrived and I would find strange things like I found a clove of garlic and I laughed and I chuckled and I cleaned the grave and I just put it back there They because they say garlic is people place garlic to ward off evil spirits. I think people go with the best of intentions. I don't think people go there to, you know, to disrespect him. I think people go there to just be close to somebody that they love so much. So people have my blessing to go to the grave and speak to him and talk to him and take pictures. And if that makes them feel a little bit more accepting of what happened and a bit more peaceful. That's fine for me. I, I don't that. have a problem with that. Yeah, well, that's good. Do you visit the grave often? Not as not all the time, uh, because as I say to you, I feel Kenan is with me all the time or with somebody that he loves and he's, he's around. And I feel he's always here with me. Uh, so I don't feel like I physically have to go to the grave to feel closer to him. But I do want to go there to make sure it looks decent. You know, I want to. And also I, I do go there and I spend time chatting to him. But I don't have to do it at the grave. I can do it right here on this couch. When I'm off the phone with you, I can just have a conversation and say, so how do you think I did on that call with Carol, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't go. I don't all the time. It's not something that I need to do all the time. And I don't see the grave as a, I, I kind of, you know, can and would always talk like when I die one day, I want you to build me a monument, you know, so maybe that's the first little monument and maybe one day we'll do a bigger one. <laughs> so one thing about my mum, she loves to tell me memories of me um, that stick out for her, you know. Uh, she always tells me the story of when I was about three or four years old and I was so excited to see her that I, I, was, I ran out the gate and she ran after me and, and the more she ran after me, the faster I ran and her heart started yeah. speeding because she was scared I was going to get hit by a car. Um, so she had yeah. to now really give it, you know, to try and catch me and, and let this three, four year old know it's not funny running near cars. Um, and that's one yeah. memory. She, she tells me this all the time and it's it's hilarious because she thinks I haven't heard the story before. And I'm like, mom, I've heard the story. Do you have a, a, a recurring memory of your son that when you have this memory, you just smile and just feel so, so blessed? Yeah. Also, again, many, but I'll tell you one. I, Kenan was such a show off. He was such a show off. And he always was since he was a little, a little toddler, you know, he, he loved the attention on him all the time. He, and I mean, we also know that he never got rid of that. It's always been the same. He loved the, being the center of attention. He loves being on stage. And even when he was a little kid, he was a performer. He always performed for the family. Every opportunity that Kenan got, he was a huge Michael Jackson fan. He would just be there doing his dances and just if you would even give him a second of attention and you will take that and you will make sure that you can't leave him. He will just perform in the lounge. If there are visitors, that's what he did. And I think that is the most endearing memory of Kenan, that he was always just so confident.
in himself. He just knew that he had superstar power from when he was a little boy. And yeah, that is probably my my most endearing memory of him. Yeah. I remember meeting him many years ago, just after Victory Lap. I worked for a magazine and I sat down with him for lunch and we chatted and he had just gotten the Michael Jackson tattoo. Um, and I yeah. asked him, you know, why did he choose the young version of, of Michael Jackson and not the Michael Jackson most of us remember, right, as an adult? And he said because of Michael's mm-hmm. innocence um, at the time. And that's why he he liked that that tattoo. And then several years that's later, the- yeah, I've seen him on stages and uh, December of 2022, he was in Margate for an East Coast radio event where he performed. Did he speak of that event? Did he say anything about, you know, coming to Durban, Margate, performing? Uh, It was very exciting for us to have him in Margate for that um, East Coast Radio Beach Festival. Yes. Look, I can't remember that specifically, but Kenan, uh, look, I mean, he, he just loved performing. He loved being on stage. So I'm sure that if you see the energy on stage and the energy of um, just Kenan around his fans and, and in performances, I think that was just his life. He loved it. He absolutely loved it. So I can't specifically recall that one, but I'm sure he had a ball. Yeah. I'm sure he did. Yeah, he did. He did. And Lynn, is there anything yeah. else that you feel like you want to share with us? Um, like I said, we are so here in Durban. Like we are very sore yeah. about what's happened, and I mean, your response to you know how you feel about Durban, I think, will give a lot of people some insights uh, in how you and your family mm-hmm. feel about us because we feel we feel horrible, right? Um, but is there anything else you'd like to share with anyone watching this video, listening to this podcast, that you feel you just want to lay the record straight about? Just starting, just maybe to finish off the Durban. I really don't feel people should take you know. It's not Durban. Who, Durban didn't kill Kenan. I want you guys to think about it that way. Durban did not kill Kenan. That's all I want to say on that. So you can't feel horrible because it happened in Durban. It's not Durban's fault that he died. You can agree with me on that, right? Absolutely, yeah. not Durban's fault that he died. So I think maybe a message that I just want to share, maybe in closing, I don't know if this is in closing, but a message that I maybe want to share is that, you know, this is hard. It is terrible. It is a tragedy. And for me as the mother, and I don't know, I'm just going to claim it that I don't, I think there's nothing more devastating than losing your child, um, especially a child that you gave birth to. So I'm not saying dads pain is less but I'm just saying as a mom so I want to I want to maybe give a message not just to the public in general but to mothers um, as well and and but maybe this is a general message it's about you know what has happened has happened we can only control the things that we can control and that that we don't can't control we can't control and we we have to let go of that so I want people to hold on to the memories. There are so many memories to hold on to. I'm not just talking about my child. I'm talking about anybody that you've lost. If I can send a message to people that have lost somebody dear to them and that that person has now gone and you can't bring them back. So focus your energy on me- remembering them and focus maybe as part of, for me, what's maybe just, I want to maybe just share about what's helping me grow around my grief because I don't believe I can ever stop grieving my son, but I can grow around my grief. And the way I do that is to to believe that I'm worthy of caring for myself, taking time out for myself, that I deserve that and that I shouldn't feel guilty about making time for me. And also to um, allow yourself to grieve. It's okay, you know. I know people say that they think I'm so strong and I'm so, you know, so courageous. And I don't know if I agree with that always. I I literally find myself in pieces all the time. It's just that when I do this interview, Carol, I kind of like, oh, I, I owe this to Carol. I have to show enough respect for Carol to show up. <laughs> so you're allowed to grieve. and. Um, Surround yourself with people who make you feel worthy of 
grief that make it okay for you that makes will make it okay for you to feel the pain and um yeah just just make sure that you keep your circle you know let it be a caring circle because this is such a devastating thing and the last thing you need is for people not to be genuine around you so there's probably so many other things i can say but i think for now i just want people to you know there is loss is a devastating thing but there is life after loss and we need to focus on the living um don't forget the ones that passed on and their memories must be always treasured and cherished but we are surrounded by people that are alive and that's you know that's what we're going forward with Yes, I can speak about this for the whole day, Carol, so yeah. maybe I should just leave it there. <laughs> I actually wanted to ask you, I know there was a, lo- a long period, of course, for obvious reasons, you were not talking to the media. My last yes. question would be, are you feeling more comfortable speaking, speaking to media because you've been processing it better or what has, because I, I literally saw your interview with Abigail and I said to Rory, yes. Lynn is talking, <laughs> let's chat to Lynn yes. uh, because we've all just been yeah. waiting obviously for you to be okay to, to speak. What sparked the, the being comfortable to start speaking? I don't think it was ever that I wasn't, wasn't comfortable. I think I, I'm always comfortable to talk. I love talking, and I think that is very healing and therapeutic for me to do. I just thought that it was time for me to uh, – people People have sent me so many messages, messages asking, how are you? We worry about you. Are you okay? We send you so much love, Glammy. And I've never replied in all of these weeks. To be honest with you, Carol, I have messages – from the 10th of February, and I try, I really try to to reply to as many as possible, but I don't think I can. I think I'm going to give up and hope that people will understand because I have now, it is now 12 weeks later, and I'm still, I'm still replying to messages from the 11th of February. That's how many I had. And um, so I'm only, I'm only done with one day <laughs> messages. So I think I just need a time to process this and I, I don't think I can ever fully process it. I don't think I can ever fully heal. So there's never going to be a perfect place or a place um, for me to say, you know what, now I'm ready. I just think that I need to start doing things. Otherwise, I will just never get there. So it was just, okay, let's start. Let's start talking to the media because everybody, there's been so many requests for interviews. And I just said to my PR, to Sheila, I said, Oh, well, not I said, she's very protective. So she said, we will not do this until you feel that you want to do it. And that's how we did it. It uh, it was just time to start saying something, I think. And also I have, as you know so well, I have so many other things that I do that I focus on. And I didn't really just want to jump from, oh, one day she was this morning mom and the next day she's now just all over doing her own things. I think there had to be a transition period for me to to talk to people, to answer some of the questions, to make people feel connected and uh, not just, oh, well, you know, you just had the speech at the memorial and then you just forgot about us. But I also want people to understand that I am a grieving mom, that they I do ask them to be understanding. I do ask them to understand that it's going to take a long time for me to be fully able to manage with as much as I did before and that I'll never be completely okay ever again, but I will be bigger and better and I will grow through this process. Yeah. I think my last question, I, you know, my daughter and uh, my son actually and and Cara were born in the same year. So I'm very aware of that age group and the questions they ask and the empathy that they have. And they're such an interesting age group being aware of themselves. And I just wonder how is she, how is she doing every day? Is every day different? Do you see a progression in, in, in dealing with dad not being there? How is she doing? She's doing fine. Uh, You know, Cairo, I think children are so much more resilient than adults are. And I think, or I believe that she will probably only fully realize the impact of losing her dad when she's older. Right now, she obviously misses him, but she she speaks about him. She plays his music. She laughs. She, she imitates him. She would put on music and she will bring the mic, especially when she sees one of us being sad. You know, she will 
I showed her the mic the other day and she would take and she would sing lemons to lemonade and or she will see us packing his stuff into boxes and, and she would say, Clammy, you can't put daddy's trophies and his awards into a, a box because daddy wouldn't like that. You know, daddy liked to show off his things. So you need to take it out. You can't put it in a box. You know, daddy would really not like that. So she's very, she's so much like a dad. She's got such a great spirit and she's such a, I don't want to say strong or courageous. I just think she's a very well-balanced child and a very well-grounded child. And this is super difficult for her, but, but it's easier for her because she's surrounded by so much love. You know, there's Nadia and there's Zintle and there's Bongani and there's me and there's Stefan and there's her grandfather. I mean, this family is just so full of love that she she's just held up all the time. And um, I really do think we're going to see it later on. You know, even at school, she's doing well. The teachers are reporting back there's a, a school psychology team that's keeping their eyes on her and nobody's concerned so she's doing really well but I think that's also because of the nurturing that comes from within the family yeah. we are very blessed to have the family that we have yeah no a beautiful family I think one picture that sticks out when you say your family is that Christmas picture at the palace uh, where you're all standing yeah. together. That was uh, a really beautiful family vacation, judging from the images. But Lynn, I really yeah. just want to thank you so much for your time. And, you know, like I said, I just want to send so much love to yourself, Zintle Bongani, as well as uh, beautiful Cairo, Nadia, and your whole support structure during this time. Um, I'm really humbled and touched that you've given me such a candid conversation, so open um, and answered every question without hesitation. Um, so I'm really, really grateful that you gave um, this interview to us. And I think it's it's going to really open a lot of people's hearts and minds to a lot of conversations around, you know, family, time, your children and just yeah. relationships overall. And, you know, as I said, I really hope and pray for justice for your family, for South Africa, and for um, Tibbs' family as well, and many others in South Africa who've fallen to horrible crimes in this country. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carol. And I do agree with you. I think for for the bigger picture, there should be justice. It's not just about me. It's not just about the family. This is not just about Kiernan. There's a bigger picture bigger than Ken and bigger than anybody else that's fallen uh, victim to crime like this in South Africa and that we have bigger issues to address I guess as a country and for that I think there should be justice but uh, it should be beyond this family mm -hmm. beyond this family well thank you again Lynn thank you thank you so much I much appreciate you and everybody else thank you so much for having me if you enjoyed my podcast, please follow or subscribe to it via ecr.co.za under podcasts. And then you'll get alerts about new episodes. And please don't keep the Carol of Foreign podcast to yourself. Let's make the circle bigger. You can also email your big questions to my producer, Rory, at ecr.co.za.